So everyone, this is Ian. Ian is in the place. It's just on your face. That's fine. <laughs> you go for emotions. It's where you will be next year at this time. We sure hope. Hopefully. He has recently accepted a job, which is hopefully where all of you will be. <laughs> and where are you going to be working? It's uh, of course Valley Medor. Mm. Pretty nice. Well, that'd be pretty nice, wouldn't it? Uh, they, there were no like really good jobs for me open this year, but they have a physics job. Well, okay. I'm a physics major, so I have two bachelors, physics and science education. And so I wanted to be a high school physics teacher, plus uh, astronomy, maybe, possibly, if they were open to that. And there weren't really that many physics jobs open. Um, and so when I interviewed <laughs> there for a, for a science job, they pretty much told me that their high school physics teacher is retiring next year. And so they're like, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, saying that that I'll get that job, and it's pretty much my dream job. And the guy's really like progressive. He's like, yeah, you totally do astronomy. That'd be great. And like, it's a really great school and stuff. Um, I have to do. Oh, I have. To, I get to do uh, one year of seventh grade uh, physical sciences. So at least it's not like biology. It's actually forces in motion and that kind of thing. But then also um, uh, two periods of ninth grade general science. I do that for a year, and then they're like, yeah, and then you'll have that other job. So yeah, foot in the door kind of thing. Congratulations. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, it was really exciting. Oh, yeah. So now he is going to tell us all about his amazing thesis. But before yes. he does that, the thesis that is online for next week, she said, like, stop at the references. It's going to be appendices that you don't have to. It's 57 pages, so don't read it. Don't read the references. I mean, like the references and all the appendices. Yeah. Who is that? Because the actual like document's only like eighteen pages. Oh, there you yeah. go. So. Yeah, mine mine wasn't exactly complete yet. I've had the research done for a year, but then all of a sudden, student teaching took over. I would suggest finishing everything before you student teach. It's been a rough year. Um, at Lone Tree, it's a. Uh, Super small school, like south east a little bit. Um, it's really funny because so I physics, but I'm all science, so I'm endorsed in science, um, physics, biology, chemistry, and earth science. And the teacher there is the only science teacher in the building in the district, actually, because she's uh, the only high school science teacher there. And so I have all four preps, um, seven different classes, all age groups. I see everyone in the district. Every day, <laughs> it's it's quite a challenge actually. Yeah. Okay. I'm Ian Spangenberg. Hello. How's everyone doing? <laughs> Excellent. So I was on my way here today. Uh, I, was, I was driving here from Lone Tree, driving, and all of a sudden I saw this boat on the side of the road. I was like, oh, that's a cool boat. And it had this uh, sign on it said for sale. I was, oh, that's ridiculous. Why, why would they write that? So I got out and put an ING on the end. Uh, all right, I did my, my, my honors thesis on the next generation science standards. They just came out with the final draft of it like last week. And so it kind of hopefully doesn't invalidate everything that I just did. But um, the draft of the standards is what just came out. The, the major document I did all of my research on was the framework. And basically it was like 50 people from across the, across the nation in all forms of teaching, elementary, high school, administrators, superintendents, um, ACT people. Uh, they all kind of collaborated together and, and asked, you know, what do we want out of education? Um, what are some of our major objectives, goals, that kind of thing? And so they wrote this huge document. I brought it with me actually. I was gonna get it out. And yeah, so this is, this is basically what I did my, my honors thesis on, this huge book. Um, and with the, uh, with the kind of focus of sequencing or the progression of curriculum topics intended to facilitate learning, how ideas kind of progress from one thing to the next. And what I really wanted to see was the, the, the next gen science standards and the framework, it's all backed by the National Research Council. Um, all the research they did, um, a lot of the authors, they're all kind of like 
all of the work was paid for and you know, done through the National Research Council. And these kind of standards, therefore, may be biased in some way because they may be basing their research on research that supports their own Agenda. goals. Um, can you shut it down? Yes. I can. Um, and so I, what I wanted to see was this, this huge research base is it um, in line with other research that is not backed by the National Research Council? And so uh, do the next-gen science standards align with modern research concerning my particular topic, curriculum sequencing? Um, sequences and patterns are all around us. The moon goes through a sequence once a month. Um, and people have studied the moon for, you know, since the earliest times. And through that study of that sequence, we can predict things. Uh, through also studies of patterns and analysis of sequencing, you can also achieve things like improving your golf swing. I'm not a golfer, but that looks like a pretty good swing, I guess. <laughs> I'm a soccer player, so it was really hard to like find a like someone kicking a ball. That'd be weird, but like a slow motion catch. Okay, uh, but anyway, sequencing is um, it's it's not only helpful to uh, for students to learn the material because they can know the, you know, what their ultimate goals are. They can know the objectives and go, that's what I'm going towards. But also by sequencing and having a kind of um, main philosophy that everyone kind of attributes to or aligns with really helps to keep the momentum going, get students into a routine of learning. Not necessarily where you're doing the same thing every day all across the nation, but that you're all learning in a, with a similar theme, with a similar, um, aim in mind, um, and that's really what sequencing, sequencing is about. Um, and the, you never like start here in your golf swing, right? Like you always start at the same place. The moon never starts at quarter moon and then goes to like full moon, like that never happens, right? So it, it's, um, it's the sequence of events is, is very important and what's, what makes that sequence uh, effective is really what I wanted to see. Uh, in terms of the next-gen science standards and modern research. Okay, uh, based on that, what are you guys studying? What, what's your subjects? ESL. ESL? Reading language arts assessment. I'm reading a research assessment. Okay. How will you structure your curriculum? What, uh, what do you foresee being the kind of general sequence of lessons that you go through? That's a really tough question. I've never thought about it before. This is really just speaks for all subjects. We're all elementary. elementary. Okay. Okay. So probably like for a reading section, you'd have like a mini lesson, maybe like twenty minutes in the beginning, then have like time for them to work by themselves, time to work with a partner, just things like that. Okay. What about year long? What's like? Uh, how do you move from idea to or major topic, major unit to major unit in say social studies? Very interesting comment. <laughs> All right, uh, the major goals of the framework were stated, um, basically knowing, using, and interpreting the scientific, ex uh, and interpreting scientific explanations of the natural world, generating and evaluating scientific evidence and explanations, understanding the nature and development of scientific knowledge, and participating productively in scientific practices and discourse. Basically, the whole document revolves around these four really broad, Topics, and this is kind of um, where I start my analysis. Um, by sequencing things along very broad topics, you, you get good coherence from, and consistency from grade levels. You get um, kind of, you know, the, the students learn in a similar way, elementary all the way through high school. Uh, that's a vertical coherence, but then also you have horizontal, so every class is kind of taught in, in a similar way. Um, okay, the, let's see, and then so you have these four bytes, this is like a computer term, I guess, <laughs> it's, uh, and they kind of go on repeat, so the, you start in elementary, you, 
do these types of things, do the same thing in second grade, third grade, all the way up, those four bytes go on, repeat, repeat. And this is it's, uh, the framework's major kind of flowchart diagram type of thing. Um, I can read through it, but you'll get an idea of it. Um, the main center is the formation of arguments, valid arguments, which you make some claim, justify with evidence, and um, then evaluate those claims based on that evidence. There's also some other um, types of things, ask questions, predict, that thing. it's a major uh, document. All right, uh, according to the framework there, scientists often draw from established theories and models to propose extensions to the theory or create new models. They often develop a model or hypothesis that leads to new questions or to investigate or alternative explanations to consider. When we talk about science in the classroom, we usually want to try and model the real world in some way. We want to say, hey, this is what science actually looks like, and we are preparing students to participate in scientific discourse. It doesn't matter if they're going into science or not. Any um, field uses these types of skills every day, whether you go into politics or any other type of teaching if it's not science. Um, just even you know, going into business, you have to be able to generate claims, use evidence as support, that kind of thing. And so if we model our curriculum, how science works in the real world, we can um, promote those skills in all students. However, that's not really the, the general idea of science. When you think of science, well, not me, but maybe not you. When you think of science, it's some mad scientist in a lab coat in the lab somewhere doing crazy stuff, making Dr. Frankenstein. Um, however, children can wear the lab coats too. Um, and science, we you know have them have them modeling using all sorts of different scientific cool stuff like math and models and simulations, learning about relationships, and then they collect data and evaluate to make those predictions, etc. I wish my kids had like lab coats. After I found this picture, I was like, I'm gonna buy lab coats for my kids, but I was like, all oh, right, they're like cost money. All right. Um, uh, so this is a lot of words, so I'm not going to read them all, but there's like 30 pages of learning outcomes in that document that the National Research Council and these authors think that students by the end of 12th grade should be able to do. Ask questions, distinguish scientific questions from non-questions. The list goes on and on and on. It's crazy huge, really cool, and it's uh, pretty long. Um, And, all right, getting now to my main point, that was a little background of the framework. Um, when students get to work in the way outlined by, um, the, by the framework, by the standards, uh, they're prepared to meet those objectives, that huge list on the previous page. Um, and I came up with, through my analysis of all this stuff, this kind of cause and effect, effect and cause relationship. Um, I found that based on the recommendations in the, in the framework, individual lessons, doesn't have to mean like you know, one day, it could be a week long or you know, even a unit, but they go in a cause to effect sequence. However, over the long term, things go in an effect cause sequence. Um, and that was an awesome picture I found online about Angry Birds, it's obviously some kid drawing. Um, and now let's explore what I mean by that. Um, okay, we don't teach subatomics and quantum mechanics in first grade. Weird, right? <laughs> Why not? If we're trying to, uh, if we're always trying to find out, you know, to, to build on our knowledge, right? Constructivism all, is all about this, this concept map where you start with a big idea and build and build and build. Well, the obvious starting place would be quarks. Then you build on that. Oh, what do quarks lead to? Oh, they lead to particles. And then you build on that. Oh, what do those lead to? It's like that's the the inclination or the implication of that flowering idea of knowledge is 
that you start with a small idea and build on it. And if that was the case, we should be teaching subatomics and quantum mechanics in first grade. However, we don't, for reasons that are obvious. Um, and it, because it, it makes sense to learn things in cause and effect sequences, um, things become, uh, the properties of things become observable, observable, perceivable, when you know how they work. It takes knowledge of how a wheel works to see why the chair moves. I should come up with that right now. What about that? Uh, I, I wouldn't start with um, you know, the, the particle interaction of the chair. No, I'll, I'll start with something a little bit more macro scale. The, the wheels of the chair, and that, that leads to the um, properties. All right, so my first example of how this works is uh, the structure and properties of matter as outlined by the framework. First, in lower grade, students would study the structure of matter. Um, so that can be just anything with playing with blocks. You study the structure of different kinds of blocks, wood and plastic and that kind of thing, and you put those together to make something big, like a building or a bridge or something like that. And that's kind of, you, you know the cause, these things fit together in a certain way, however way I design it, and you see the effect of it. You see a building being created. And then the relationship between that structure and function become emerges in that idea. You have all of a sudden these blocks fitting together to make a building, and their, their structure, thus the emerging function, is realized. Um, based on that relationship, you see students start to characterize and uh, patternize. Is that, is that a word? <laughs> Sorry, I contacted Webster before. Uh, they emerge, and so those patterns, these predictions, uh, can only be realized by understanding this cause and effect relationship. Therefore, as students get better practice at building buildings out of blocks, they can start to see, hey, maybe I can make this other model and start to imagine and predict different combinations of blocks to make other effects. Um, and then finally, uh, students begin studying something smaller. They understand how blocks become buildings, but then what makes the blocks? Well, then you can go in a little bit smaller. And so you have a cause and effect relationship in individual lessons, for instance, blocks, building, building, but you go effect to cause in the opposite direction over the long term. Um, my best example, I put it in the, in the document I sent out, was the wheel. You would, if you were doing a long term unit on the wheel, why does the wheel make the car move in the way that it does? Um, so, you would first, in your lesson, talk about what about the wheel creates that motion. You want to know the cause and the effect. Then, once you kind of analyze that, you are able to predict certain types of wheels. Why don't block-shaped wheels work? You can make predictions about that. However, once you get that down, once you get down that general cause-to-effect relationship, you can go down a little bit further and go, okay, well, what makes the wheel hand, uh, act in that way? You go down to axle, etc. So you, you go in one direction in individual lessons and then in the opposite direction over the long term. Um, in turn, we do experimentation with the uh, investigation to find out how the axle, new cause, makes the wheel turn, the new effect. And so this, again, is an example of an individual lesson where you have uh, study of cause to effect relationships only we've moved in the opposite direction uh, over the long term sequence. Um, and then eventually you get into subatomics. What about nuclei and particle interactions and quantum mechanics forms the things that forms the things that forms the things that makes the wheel that turns the axle, etc. And then uh, Okay, uh, and so this progression not only teaches the concepts, but also gives incredible practice to the, the uh, by the end of 12th grade stuff. I love students. <laughs> All right. Um, because if we want students to be able to um, do all of that stuff, they need practice doing it. We wouldn't just throw a bunch of concepts at them. We would give them practice, and based on 
students' abilities to comprehend abstract material, we want to give it to them in a way that is actually uh, useful or is that, is, that is possible. Why wouldn't we teach quantum mechanics in first grade? Well, they wouldn't be able to comprehend it. So we start in a way that they can comprehend and our sequence progresses in a way that as they grow older, as they're able to deal with more complex and abstract thoughts, that we move into a smaller and smaller, more abstract and complex structure. Um, and then also in doing so, we're giving them practice on investigation, experimentation, claim generation, all that cool stuff on that other list. Aha! <laughs> all right, so you're probably wondering what this thing is at the front of the room, possibly. I just left it here. All right, uh, brought my safety glasses, good science. Um, all right, we, we, for this example, have been studying the expansion of solids in the last two weeks of our class, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and one of the experiments we did was this one. Where's my mouse? Why can't I? Technology master, by the way. All right. So this is one of the experiments we did in class last week. This is to remember I'm a second trimester <laughs> biomedical science student. When I first graduated high school, I. Good talk. All right. Notice how the ball fits through the ring pretty easily. We're heating the ball up. <laughs> Whoa! The ball doesn't fit through the ring anymore. Why did that happen? Then he cools it back down with some ice water, and it fits back through. Ta-da! about, we learned this in class, of course, through that experiment, through our investigations, that when things such as solids heat up, they expand. Um, that's just kind of one of those things of nature. We learned the cause of heating up, and we learned the effect, expansion. Now, because we have that idea, we can move into our next phase and go, okay, what about the, how about in the particle model? Why is that expansion occurring? We know now that expansion occurs in this, uh, in this fashion. And we can, oh, sorry. And we can even explain things in our pragmatic world about it. Has anyone ever seen these on bridges? Yeah. Yes. Do you know why that they have these things on bridges? Because no. it's expansion when it gets hot. Totes with goats. They have <laughs> these things on bridges because when it gets hot out in the summer, the solid, the cement, is expanding and they have to have room for those to expand into. Otherwise, your bridge will go to beans. Bad news bears. <laughs> Things condense when it gets cold, or is it just the mm -hmm. absence of heat? Or do they get smaller in the summer? Yeah, they get smaller. Mm -hmm. Which is why the ball, it didn't fit through the ring, but then he cooled it down with the ice water, and then it did fit. So in the, in the winter, when it's super cold out, you'll have kind of separation. And you might notice in the winter, when you're going over bridges, you have a little bit more of a cocoon, cocoon in the winter when you're going over that bridge because there's a bigger hole there. We can figure out, just through experimentation, the things that exist in our world. 
and we've done it through a cause and effect relationship. We've learned the cause, things expand when they get hot, and we see the effect, things that are pragmatic and ap applicable in our world. Now we'll go down to the particle model. We'll do some investigations on the particle model. Basically what's happening, the, as we've learned a million times, of course, <laughs> that when things are cold, all their atoms, all their molecules are vibrating a little bit. They're, they're chilly, they're vibrating. And when things heat up, they get really fast and they start vibrating a lot, thus pushing each other apart. This one hits this one and it goes shabam. This one hits this one and then it, everything's expanding because the particles are hitting each other and vibrating faster. Thus you have expansion. Yes. So then we would learn that and all of a sudden, with the particle model at our back, that understanding, now we can learn a new effect. We know the cause, new effect. Mm -hmm. Safety glasses, of course. Uh, we need the lights, possibly, for you. Perfect. Okay. Notice which light is on. Yeah, okay. I'm going to heat up this ring in the center. And the other one turns on. Whoa! Crazy, <laughs> right? Now, I'm just going to let that be for a little bit, and I bet you that that light will turn off and the other one will turn back on. We can explain this phenomenon using our particle model. And it actually has a pragmatic application in real life as well. Yeah, you can turn I was going to say, you want the lights back? Yeah. You're going to tell us what the pragmatic application oh, yeah. is in real life? This. Oh, yeah. Oh. You know what this is? Smoke detector. Smoke detector. Uh, close. It's your thermostat in your oh. house. Not the digital ones. Those have, like, <laughs> digital probes. But... You have a metal here, you have your coil that expands and contracts as it gets hotter and colder, shabam. And you can set your thermostat, click, 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 and it sets the distance of this connection. As it expands, gets hotter, it will move away from the connection. As it gets cooler, contracts, gets smaller, it will curl towards and make the electrical connection. You set, your, um, you set your thermostat at 71 degrees, click, it drops to 70 degrees, it makes the connection, goes to bands, electricity happens, and your furnace turns on. Same way that this does. I heated it up, this metal ring expanded, and it clicked on the other circuit. Yeah. <laughs> And then it cooled down, this metal ring contracted, and it clicked onto the other circuit. And we now can explain this pragmatic application because of our newly found cause. So does the smoke detector work in the same way, or does it just... Uh, does it smoke just detectors... Stop. I don't actually know about that. These things are sprinklers done by heat, not smoke. I don't know. <laughs> I think they are. Uh, oh, the smoke detectors are from the actual smoke or something. Yeah. Right? Is it from the smoke? Okay. Well, some smoke detectors are heat, though. Okay, anyway. I anyway. Sorry. I'll research <laughs> it and let you know. Next time I do, uh, do one of these, I will let you know. Um, okay. And, okay, so that's kind of basically what I found in the, in the, the framework and the standards is this sequence of events, these sequence, this progression of lessons and topics and ideas where you move in one direction in very specific uh, subjects, so in forces and motion, structure and matter, uh, structure of matter, that kind of thing. You move in a cause to effect sequence, but then over the long term, you move in the opposite direction, effect and cause. Um, it's really prevalent throughout the standards. Um, I gave a bunch of examples. Uh, and then, like I said, I uh, wanted to see if that was biased in any way, if I could find an example of this 
in other situations and other research. One of the places I looked was a guy named David Clark. He did a huge study in 2002, well, it was published in 2002, and um, he came up with these spaces. Um, he came up with two spaces based on his study, a hypothesis space and a, an experiment space. And uh, I, I love this quote, normal cognitive processes enable humans to generate precise definitions, systematic choice of experimental material, and a logical economy. Uh, what I really want to show is that he came up with two spaces, a space of hypothesis and a space of experiments. Uh, a little bit about his experiment. It was a big tank computer program. Basically, the tank drives and fires um, with rules unknown to the user, so it's not just push forward to go forward. It was a combination of forward, left, up, down, 7, R, you know, you had to figure out the combination of rules that made the tank go and then you know, destroy your um, enemy. And the rules imposed are extremely contradictory and counterintuitive to how we normally operate computers and operate things like tanks. Not that I've ever <laughs> driven a tank, but, uh, but you know, if you put me in, and give me enough time, I could probably figure something out, right? But these tanks didn't operate according to those uh, kind of intuitive designs. And what he looked at was to see what the process was through which uh, young people, teenagers, adults went through to figure out how to achieve the, um, the desired outcome. Um, <clears throat> and he came up with these two states. The first was the hypothesis. Uh, in order to actually design an experiment to go, you know, how does this tank move, you first have to play around and discover, just, you have to just try some stuff out. You have to push some buttons and see what happens. You have to have a cause and effect. You have to push forward and see what happens. Cause and see what happens. In an unknown cognitive environment, students have to see some of the effects resulting from certain inputs first. Um, that's the single lesson phenomenon. Um, especially when uh, one or more hypotheses are under consideration, there's thousands of different operations you could do to move the tank, to fire the tank, and it's not immediately obvious what would constitute a good experiment other than just playing around at first. Oh, I'm used to the smart word. Uh, and then, secondly, after you play around and develop some hypotheses, then you can enter the experiment space where a scientist is faced with a problem-solving task, paralleling their search for their hypotheses, and they work in this space requires domain-specific knowledge in terms of content and constraints of discovery. Um, and uh, some general knowledge like the constraints of your ability to perceive, reason, that kind of thing. And I said that this was similar to the effect through the cause because you need first some domain-specific knowledge. For instance, you had to know that things expand when they get hot first in order to go to the particle model. You had to know that things expand first. It had some domain-specific knowledge in order to apply it to that new situation. And we have to, um, in order to devise, to talk about an experiment, to actually uh, test some of our ideas, to test some of our predictions, we had to know the, the acuity of our ability to perceive things. For instance, no telescope or mic telescope, no microscope can actually resolve, well, especially in the high school level, can actually resolve atoms or molecules bouncing around and moving. Um, how, do we, how can we test this? So that it, actually designing an experiment requires some domain-specific knowledge and some knowledge about how you can actually uh, get results from a good experiment going back to that you know, valid question, that kind of thing. Um, and it is this way where the effect leads to the cause, that long-term um, sequence of events that I was talking about, because in order to figure out what's happening, in order to figure out you know, how to move the tank, you have to know some stuff first. So that you have to see the effects and then be able to design your experiment to figure out the underlying motives and methods Um, all right, and then in the end, uh, he 
said that uh, that using evidence to uh, to evaluate things involves a comparison of the predictions derived from the current hypotheses with the results obtained from the experimentation. It's kind of just a definition of what it means to do a good experiment. But he in, insists that you need both these spaces, the hypothesis and experiment space, to come up with a, an effective claim and to justify it. Um, you can't just come up with some claim if you don't have any domain-specific knowledge, and you can't just come up with a claim out of the blue about the tank if you've never actually you know, saw what happened before in it, with it. Um, and then, I, I don't want to take all of your guys' time, but there, I looked in hundreds, not hundreds, hundreds of other places <laughs> uh, and found similar parallels. Uh, I'm totally going to ruin his name and Lori's going to be mad at me, but just since Mahali, it's like Lori's favorite. Sounds good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And she's going to make fun of me for not saying it correctly. Uh, talented teenagers, that's uh, about gifted students. I could, you know, I have a whole thing about, you know, what he says and how that kind of parallels the, uh, this cause and effect, effect to cause thing. Also Sternberg, his triarch uh, theory, parallels it perfectly. AP <laughs> vertical teams, anyone? follows the AP team stuff. They have something that perfectly does it. And then just some uh, curriculum book I found lying around somewhere, the Mitchell Excellent Zoo, which unless you've, you've worked with that bar very particular curriculum, you've never heard of it. So uh, I find this kind of, this sequence of events in a multitude of different areas, in gifted ed, in Sternberg, one of the you know crowning achievements of of uh, intelligence theory, that kind of thing, and current uh, curriculum guides which lead kids to college and college level classes, and then just any curriculum book I've picked up, I see this type of sequencing emerge. Um, therefore, my recommendations are teach science in this way. Uh, and keep calm and teach science. Uh, oh yeah, and then I, when I was looking through Sternberg, I found this quote, and it pretty much sums up my argument pretty well. It's a lot of words, but I'll just read it. Our pleasure at finding that a chaos of facts is the expression of a single underlying fact is like the relief of a musician at resolving a confused mass of sound into a melodic or harmonic order. The passion for parsimony, for the economy of means in thought, is the philosophic passion par excellence. But alongside of this passion for simplification, there exists a, sis, a sister passion. This is the passion for distinguishing. Um, it is the impulse to be acquainted with the parts rather than to comprehend the whole. And that was William James, pretty famous educator. Um, thanks. About um, his about research from his presentation or about writing the thesis. So in your paper, you start off about the research about the example or whatever. Mm -hmm. Did that happen before you decided to start the project? Yeah, mm -hmm. that and happened in my elementary what, practicum. Like, does that have anything to do with it? Or? Yeah, uh, it's actually um, it's a really good interview answer by the way. It was like <laughs> what got me into. Science was, I, um, I started in a lab in the physics and astronomy department, uh, just doing research. I sat at a computer and did data analysis forever and ever. And uh, I looked over at my boss, the PhD professor, and he was doing the same thing. And just kind of like, oh, that's not really what I want to do with my life. And so I tried to, I tried other avenues, that kind of thing. And as I started to TA for courses, to uh, tutor for tutor, tutor Iowa, I found that I really liked the, um, kind of the, the learning aspect of science. I really, like, I, I, it was always science forever and ever, but mm -hmm. I never really knew I, I liked teaching until I started to try it out. And I found that I liked that analysis of how ideas became, um, mm -hmm. uh, how you construct ideas, that kind of thing. Um, and that's, that's really how I approach teaching still to this day as kind of an, an experiment. Um, try things out. Do they work? Oh, all right, I'll try something else, like, or the opposite direction. And so with that mindset, I did my elementary practicum in first grade.
grade, which is interesting. <laughs> I found that I'm definitely a high school teacher, but it was still a, a really good uh, experience. I liked it because it's really easy just to like, to start teaching in first grade. I don't call it easy by any way. Like, I'm not one of those guys like, oh, anyone could teach first grade. No, totally not. But I found it way easier to stand up in front of a, bu of a bunch of first graders for the very first time as opposed to like ninth graders or something like that. So it was really good in that way. But then, yeah, it also reinforced my, um, my kind of passion for teaching too when I got students asking those types of questions and it's always just been kind of that how do I ideas come to be and I always just thought that story was really kind of um, exemplary of that. Yeah. Cool. That's a pretty long-winded answer for... No, no, that's, <laughs> that's good. Okay. You can just, yeah. yeah. Um, so let's see. Um, Haven't written literature review analysis part of your thesis yet? Like, I know, right? <laughs> don't don't wait until your student teaching semester to uh, to write it. Like, I thought if I had all my research done, I could just type it up, and, like type the paper. All my research has been done for a year, but it's actually like the typing of the paper has plagued me a little bit. Um, so don't wait, do it soon. Um, any uh, conclusions or suggestions about how to structure science curriculum? Yeah, I uh, basically I would say that do things where you you capture their attention early, and then they and then students are able to try and investigate or explain those things that you do. Um, a lot of times, I, I do a, a kind of a role reversal where I make a false claim. I, I I say something that I know in my own head to be false, and I make students not prove. You know, so to use the word use the word prove science, but to uh, make counterclaims and justify their claims with evidence and prove me wrong. I, it's kind of a, it's one of those things where students are able to experiment and investigate with a purpose in mind, where they, they have something really cool right off the bat, and then they really want to explain those things. Um, that's kind of how I approach science. Um, other subjects that it might translate into Uh, I mean, any subject, especially in the high school level, um, deals with claims and evidence. Whether you're talking about social studies and history, or um, you know, English, you're writing some paper on To Kill a Mockingbird, you're, you're making some claims and saying, this is why I think this. And so those skills, those kind of um, investigative and experimentation tools are uh, um, analogous, are transferable to any Elementary is a yes. <laughs> I don't know off the top of my head why it would. Uh, I mean, obviously, the, the science part would, um, that's kind of the major point of this all, is that it has to start in elementary. Um, but in terms of you know, like learning addition and that kind of thing, I don't really know. Question mark. Um, yeah, and then I did not have to be approved by art. That was one of the, that's why I thought it was going to be a lot more difficult to do. I thought, it, like, in my, in my mind, it was going to be a lot more difficult to, um, like, do a study and get IRB approval and all that kind of stuff, so I just had to do a literature review. Looking back now, I don't know if it's actually the case. Like I said, I've spent a year and a half on this paper, on this thesis. That's good to know. Why do we have those? Retentions at the end of the year. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> sorry. Guys, I'm not helping my stress level right now. Yeah. Yeah. How did you decide to do that? This? Why this? Like, what the, um, you can talk about the, what your initial idea was and how it yeah. morphed over time. Sure. Um, I really like standards based grading. I think it's super cool and I like uh, I could talk for days about standards based grading. Um, and what I really like about it is the kind of um, the consistency you get across grade levels, both vertically and horizontally, and the kind of um, ownership students get from standards-based grading. 
on their own learning. And with the, I knew that the, the next gen science standards were going to be being released in the next year. They, they went through like a bunch of drafts. First they, the authors, there's like 50 of them, published like a, a public document that uh, peers could comment on. So other teachers, administrators, that kind of thing. And then they revised the, the, the draft. And then they, uh, and then they released it to like the public and had just any person comment on it. And then they revised it based on that. So they went through a number of revisions and it's, it's been in the works for like a couple years now. The framework came out in I think 2010, I think. And so it's, it's been a, a little bit in the making. Um, and so I knew those were coming out until I wanted to, um, like it's, it's the new thing on, you know, the new thing on the hill, it's the new, really awesomely re researched literature base for how to teach science in public education. And so I, I wanted to have a reason to investigate it a little bit more thoroughly. I mean, whether I did this or not, I probably would have read the whole book, but um, I don't know, I, I just, I wanted to, I always think that if you can talk about or write about what you're thinking, it makes it, it solidifies what you're thinking a little bit more. Like you can read the book and be like, oh, that was cool. But then when you actually like do a literature review of it, I think that you understand it a little bit more. So that kind of grew out of just a, a, a desire to analyze the new standards that were coming out because it's going to be a part of my life for the next uh, you know, 20 years or so. The, the old standards, the one that those replaced came out in the early 90s. And we've kind of, like all the core, the stuff that we're doing, a lot of the other types of standards are based somewhat on those, and so this is the new basis. So I wanted to talk about that. Well, we're out of time, but if you have more questions, you can stay and ask Egan after I turn off the tape recorder. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you Yay, for coming. Thank you. And speaking.